You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well, Jesus. You have done me well. Done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well, Jesus. You have done me well. You have done me well. Oh, you have done me well. You have done me well, Jesus. You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well, Jesus. You have done me well. 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 You have done me well, Jesus. You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well, Jesus. Many find out me. Many find out me. Many find out me. Many find Peace of mind uh, if I don't play the guitar. <laughs> uh, let me teach you a chorus. Just turn to your neighbor and tell him, No, he not. Turn to your neighbor. No, he not. You are the temple. No, he not. No, he not. You are the temple. No, he not. No, he not. You are the temple. 
You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Knowing not, knowing not, you are the temple. Knowing not, knowing not, you are the temple. Knowing not, knowing not, you are the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes, we are. Yes, we are, we are the temple. Yes, we are, yes, we are, we are the temple. Yes, we are, yes, we are, we are the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now you can sing. So join me. No, he not. No, he not. Let's let's lower the key. No, he not. No, he not. No, he not. You are the temple. No, he not. No, he not. You are the temple. No, he not. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am the temple. I am the temple of the Holy This is New Year with a singing bishop. <laughs> Amen. We want to hear the word of God. I kindly ask you to turn to the book of Hebrews. We will read verse 5 and 6 where our New Year sermon comes from. Then I will share with you some thoughts from that passage. It's a long time since I played the guitar. Uh, I think maybe one of my resolutions is to get back to play the guitar. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said... Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord 
is my helper. I will not be afraid what mere mortal do to me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortal, what can mere mortals do to me? Amen. We are in a new year. We are in a new decade. We are in a new season. It's a time for new resolutions. It's a time for newness. Because a new season presents opportunity for us to be excited like we have been excited as we turn new pages. But it could also be a, a point where some of us are fearful of the unknown. For beyond the uncharted waters, there may be dragons, but there may be also beautiful rivers. Consequently, we must face the uncertain future to know what it holds for us. You know, like a ship that is in stormy waters, we will go up and sometimes we will go down. Like the poet said, sometimes I am up and sometimes I am down. But no matter what, we must go on. This year, some may go up, some may go down. But whatever the case, we must keep on going forward. Our theme for this year is give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. We will talk more about that theme on Sunday. But for now, the Lord has put this passage or has given me this passage to share with you. And I have four points that will ground us, I believe, for us as we face a year when we are saying, give me this mountain. In the passage that we read, chapter 5, I mean chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible tells us, let or keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If you read the King James Version of the Bible, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. The word conversation here stands for behavior. Let your lifestyle, let your conduct be in such a way that you are not covetous or you do not what the NIV calls have the love of money. And the first point that I see here is that God is telling us to be content with his provision. So contentment of God's provision. Contentment with God's provision is the first thing that we must have. So that we are not covetous. So that our conversation is without covetousness. So that our lives are lived free of the love of money. When I talk of contentment, the contentment because of God's provision, I am not saying that we become slothful or lazy. We are not to neglect the business of life or pretend that apathy is what the Bible is commending for us. That would be inconsistent with what the Bible teaches. We will work hard, but we will learn to be content in the fact that God 
has promised to supply to all our needs. He adds that contentment, there's a man called John Brown, and he says that contentment is a satisfaction with God as our portion and what he has appointed for us. Contentment is when we are satisfied that we have God on our side and whatever else he may have added on top of it. It is opposed to covetousness or the inordinate desire for wealth. That unbelieving anxiety, the dissatisfaction with what is present and distrust as to what is future. I will repeat that. And they are the words of John. It is opposed to covetousness or the inordinate desire of wealth and believing anxiety, dissatisfaction with what is present, distrust as to what is future. In other words, when you have covetousness, you will not be satisfied with what you currently have. Instead, you will have an inordinate, an evil desire, and uh, also unbelieving anxiety. You will be living in worry. You can never live true to the words of Jesus that we should not wor worry about life. But we are called to know that God has promised that he will satisfy all our needs. You see, discontentment is a sickness. It is a disease. When you are discontent, <coughs> it makes you... <coughs> the discontent is made poor even when rich. But when you have contentment, which literally means you are self-contained, it makes the poor rich. Discontentment makes the rich poor because they are not satisfied. They don't have enough. While contentment, contentment makes the rich, I mean the poor, to be rich because he's satisfied. Wanting only the things that you already have. That's what contentment is all about. In the, book so, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible tells us that he that loveth silver shall never be satisfied with silver. Either you can't get enough of it, or when you get it, you will, found, you will find that it is not meeting the real need that you have. Solomon should know better. He was the wisest man, and he says that the person who loves silver will never be satisfied with the silver. It is like the man who is drinking salty water. I am told the more you drink, the more you crave for more. If you are drinking salty water, it makes you to thirst for more. And when you are discontent, you are like that person. But this year, the Lord is asking us to trust his provision for us and to be content and to be happy with him, to be satisfied with what he has prepared, what he has given us, and what he is to us, and then we will be rich. And then it shall be well with us. Sometimes we do not know what blessing it is that God has given us by denying us the things that we crave. There is a blessing when God has denied you anything. It is for your good. This is not a very good sermon to preach at the beginning of the year, but I think it is important. And hence the urge for us to be content with such things as we currently have. If you have just God and are content, then you are rich enough. 
When he wants to add your material possessions, then he will. My brothers and sisters, the word of God in 1 Timothy 6, 6 is true. Godliness with contentment is a great gain. It is enough to have godliness and to have God. In itself, it is a great gain, no matter what else we may be imagining that we are lacking. Imagine how foolish we must be to strain, to stress, and to stress, I mean, and to fret so much for riches that we shall not take to the grave. But we always are fretting and worried and wondering what we will, you know, what we what more we need to have. Or I mean about what more we think we should have. The story is of is told of a man who was very rich. And he felt he can't leave everything behind. So he told his wife, when I die, make sure that part of my wealth, half of my wealth is buried with me, part of my riches. When he died, he had a very shrewd wife. The wife was asked, what did you do? She said, I wrote him a check and buried him with a check. Amounting to have the amount that he wanted. I don't know whether he ever drew the, out the money. We will never take these things. Let us learn contentment. This is what the Bible is telling us. To be free of the love of money. Should we not be content and full of thanksgiving to God when we have food and clothes that our basic needs have been met? We should be always thanking God. It is Paul writing to the Philippians that he said, I have learned to be content whether I have a lot or I have little. There is a book, an old book, that I would recommend. It's a classic. If you ever can get a copy of it, it is called The Rare Jewel of Contentment. The Rare Jewel of Contentment by a man called Jeremiah Barrows. The Rare Jewel of Contentment. It's written in Old King James English, but it's a beautiful book on the on the issue of contentment and he takes just that one verse the whole book is from that one verse and some of the things that he says is that paul says i have learned it is not something that comes to us by default it is a learned thing you can learn it means that if you have not learned to be content, you can learn. There is a possibility. You can choose to learn and actually learn to be content. If you are seated in this place and you are wondering how can anybody ever be content, you can learn to be content. Paul said, I have learned to be content. In Philippians 4, I believe it's verse 12, I have learned to be content no matter what situation I am in. Whether I am in abundance, I have learned to be happy. And when I am in want, I have learned also to be content. God has taught me to be content. And if we can learn that, my brothers and sisters, our life will be much more fulfilling. Our life will be much more richer than the people who are ever anxious and worried about what they want and are always craving for. Material things are good as they are, but they never meet our deepest longing. They are there for us to use, but they are not there to rule us. And the things that we love, like I said, they do not satisfy us. I remember once hearing this story from 
our bishop emeritus. How one day his children, I think they I can't quite remember the details, but th the part that uh, I remember is helpful, is that the children, his children, or his, yeah, when they were children, they loved ice cream. And one day they went to the fridge and took ice cream, and I'm sharing this because he shared it publicly, and they ate the ice cream without the permission of the parents. And what he did is that he went and got a lot of ice cream and brought it to them and told them, you love ice cream? Sit, eat, continue eating, and eat. And they ate at the beginning with Larish. <coughs> and they ate. And they said, we have had enough. No, you love ice cream? Eat. Until they could not eat anymore. And even what they had eaten, they hated it. The things that we love are like that. We can never be fully satisfied. And what God has given you in the present, give thanks for them. Amen? It is enough of the ice cream that God has given you. Don't crave for too much of it. If he allows you to have too much of it, you will rough it. The Bible tells us that Jesus told a man, and telling him, he also tells us in Luke 12, verse 15, take, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. Your identity, your important, your significance is not out of what you possess. There are higher and greater things other than the pursuit of material riches that should require and receive more of your energies. And this year, as we say, give me this mountain, let it not be about just material things. There are some spiritual things. There are some other things that are higher, that are greater, that you should crave for. Let it not be that you will be tempted to say, give me this mountain. And you're thinking of how you can be a billionaire, no matter how you get the billions. Am I saying that riches are bad? No. I am saying, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you what is right for you. This is a guarantee that cannot be tampered with. And that removes all fear. When we delight ourselves in the Lord. The true and noble and real desires of your heart can only be met only by God. And there are those desires in your heart that are noble and that are real and that are true and God is willing to meet them. Consequently, let your life be free from the love of money and learn to be content in the fact that God is going to make provisions for you <clears throat> in the year 2020. But secondly, in this passage, we are to know the companionship of God's presence. The companionship of God's presence. In that verse 5, the B part, it says, For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whatever you are going to face this year, God will be there. You didn't hear me. Whatever it is that you are going to go through this year, God is going to be there. Your neighbor didn't hear it. So tell him for me, God is going to be there. I don't know whether you are going to go through recession. I don't know whether it is the economy that is going to go down. I don't know what insecurity you are going to face. 
I don't know what is going to happen in your family. Maybe this is the year of your final exams. Are you anxious about the rising discrimination? Are you anxious about the hostility that we are facing as Christians? Are you concerned about the things that are happening all around you? God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I will never let you down and I will not let off your hand. I will be holding you. If you are a Christian, God is telling you that loneliness is imaginary. Let me repeat. Are you born again, a child of God? Loneliness is imaginary for you. Because God is always going to be there. He will not abandon you. Leaving means abandoning you to your own. But he also says, not only that, I will be present, but not only that, I will not forsake you. When I am here, I will not neglect my responsibility and my duty to you. I will love you and I will be present to help you. All your needs, I will be concerned about them. <coughs> I will give you companionship. Brothers and sisters, it means that we have no reason to be fearful. God promises companionship by Hitler saying, I will never. No, not ever. Actually, that's how the Bible should read. In the original language, the Greek, it says, I will never, no, not ever. No, never leave you, nor forsake you. I will never, no, not ever, no, ever <coughs> leave you, nor forsake you. I will always be there. We have a friend that sticks closer than your pastor. We have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We have a friend that will stick closer than your relative. I am saying there is a friend that will stick closer than your spouse. There is a friend who will not leave you no matter what happens. And he wants you to know that in the year 2020, he is ever present. It means God will not give up on you. He will not abandon you in the face of the faith celebrations that may be happening elsewhere. <coughs> Lonely because of climbing a corporate ladder, God says I'll be there. Lonely because of misunderstandings, God says I'll be there. Lonely because you are in a terminal illness, God is there. Lonely because you have been divorced, God will be there. Lonely because you are deserted, God will be there. Lonely because of retirement, God will be there. Lonely because nobody has brought his application, God is there. Lonely because of old age, he will be there. Lonely because your loved one has gone away in terms of being invited to heaven, God will be there. Whatever happens, God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. The story is told of David Livingstone sitting at a campfire somewhere in Africa, surrounded by hostile tribes in the jungle. And on the 14th of January, 1856, he wrote this in his journal. Quote, felt much turmoil of spirit in, prospe in prospect of having all my plans for the welfare of this great nation and this teeming population 
knocked on the head by savages tomorrow. He thought Africans were savages. Maybe they were at that time. But he was anxious. He continues, but I read that Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And because of that, David Livingstone continues to say, this is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor. Jesus has said, I will never leave you. I will not cross secretly as I have intended. So he writes, I will not cross secretly. Actually, the word he uses is furtively, which means secretly, as I had intended. Why should such a man as I flee? I shall take observations of latitude and longitude tonight, though it may be the last. I feel quite calm now. Thank God. He read the words that Jesus has all the power, and Jesus has said that I will be with you always to the ends of the world. And for that reason, he said, I am going to face my challenges boldly, with courage, with assurance that things are going to work out well. And I will not sneak. I will not hide because I have a promise that God will not leave me. He will not forsake me. I am telling you, no matter what will come this year, God will be there. So he has promised he will provide. Therefore, we can be content. He has promised he will be available. And therefore, we can stand on that word that he is present. But beyond that, he says that we should know the confidence of his promise. God's pro confidence of his promise. And I love this. <clears throat> it says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you see, a promise is no better than the one who makes it. If I make a promise to you, you can only trust it to the extent that you believe I am able to fulfill that. But when it is a promise from God, you can know that it will stand. Again, where it says in English, he has said, actually it is an emphatic he. He himself has said. He himself. Yeye mwenyewe. Ndiye amesema. It is not somebody else who has said it, but he himself. It is not your employer. It is not your pastor. It is not your brother. It is not your father. It's not your spouse. It is not your employer. It's not your parent. But God himself has said it. And his promise is as sure as he is. He is the God that does not change. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not lose any of his ability, any of his power, any of his goodness. He does not get better. He does not get better. Was he remains totally perfect and his promise is as good as he is. God's promise is better than the millions in the bank. God's promises are better than the promises we receive from our government. Million times better. The promise of God is many times better than the sermons by the pastors including this one. You see, in Psalms, uh, Psalms 89, verse 34, the Bible says, <clears throat> his word is forever fixed in heaven. I will not violate my covenant 
or alter what my lips have uttered. The writer of that psalm is reminding God, your word is forever fixed in heaven. And you have said you will not alter or violate. You will not break trust. You will not break the word that you have said. You have made a promise. It can be relied upon. And my brothers and sisters, has he said he will bless you? Then he will. Has he said I will be there? Then he will be there. Has he said he will supply? Then he will supply. Has he said that it shall be well with the righteous? Then it shall be well. The devil may try to preach otherwise, but the word of God is true. Who said, but the omnipotent, the all-powerful God? Who said this, but the omniscient, the all-knowing God, the all-ever-present God, omnipresent God? And this is the confidence that we will carry as we go through this year. When they say, or when you hear that, God, I just don't have the strength for this year, Remember that the omnipotent or the all-powerful God has said, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. And when you say, God, I am afraid I have to go through this year alone. Then remember God has said that it is I who will never leave you, not forsake you. And he is ever present. When you say, God, I won't know what to do. Then the all-wise God, omniscient, not the, I had said all-knowing, but it's all-wise God, says, I will never leave you, so I'll give you wisdom. I will not forsake you. I will give you the wisdom what to do. What a friend we have in this God. All our sins, all our griefs, all our worries, all our concerns, all our anxieties, we can take them to him in prayer. What a privilege we have to have such as our father. This is not just an advice, but this is a promise from the word of God. Oh, that you might hear the voice of God underlying the voice of the spirit, saying that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and that is my promise to you. Friend, you can go through 2020 confident because of this promise. God's promise is sure. I say that he will provide for you. And I say that he is ever present. And I have said that this promise is from God. And finally he says that you will know the courage of his protection. See, verse 6 tells us, he has said. And because he has said, we can say. You see? So we say with confidence. I, this version is not good. It is not giving the, the proper way it should be read. Let me get it in the New King James Version, which says this. Verse 6. So we may boldly say, sorry, 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 uh, I, it's me who had read badly. It is from verse 5. It says, B, for he himself, this is New King James, the himself is here. It wasn't in the NIV. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, because God has said, we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Or what can mere man, what can mortal do to me? What can man do to me? It's a question. What can man do to me? God has said he will never leave me. He will not forsake me. What can man do to me? You see, these words 
if you check in your Bible, you will see they are indented. Because they are quotation from the book of Psalms 118, verse 5 to 7. And this is what verse 5 to 7 in the psalm says. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph over my enemies. The psalmist is saying, when hard pressed, when in difficult situation, I cried to the Lord and he brought me to a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? You know, God is going to help me. What can mortals do to me? In other words, God is my protection. God is my security. And now the writer of Hebrews is saying, God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that we can say, and not just say, we can boldly, we can confidently, we can assuredly, we can with assurance say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my protection. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my sustainer. What can anybody do to me? What do you need to say today? You see, I don't know what it is that you are facing. But you get the word of God. And by faith, you say, God has said, therefore I say. We are connected to heaven. The will of heaven is executed here on earth. As we believe his word and act on it. As we have faith. And faith is like the hedges that allow the great doors to swing open or to swing so that they can be closed. So we need faith, but faith is based on the word of God. If it is not based on the word of God, then it is mere presumption. God has said, consequently, I have the faith to say, I am protected. I am secured. With faith, we become heroes with God. When we have God with us, our names will be changed. Like Abraham received his new name. He had been Abram, but now father of many nations. Sarai was changed to Sarah because of faith, because of believing God. See, when you have this faith, it acts as an antidote to covetousness that we started with. Because God has said he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. So that we can say, I am not worried. I am not anxious. 2020 will be stress-free year for me. Amen? Have faith in what God has said and then say it and repeat it as an expression of faith. It is not going to be all honey and bees. I mean, all honey and no bees, sorry. <laughs> oh, we will need help this year. But my dear friend, this coming year, oh, not coming, this year, <laughs> it has already arrived. We will face it no matter what it throws at us. Come, baby, come. Eh? Come, baby, come. God is with me. He is going to protect me. Devil, do your worst because God is with me. We can stand on the promises of God. The Lord is going to be our helper. 
we will not fear. Amen? You see, the writer is writing to, he is writing to the Hebrew. And the Hebrews, at this time when they are receiving this message, they were facing opposition. They were also, the Christians that received this letter were facing opposition. They were also facing mockery and brutality and also robbery in their families. They were losing friends and foes because of the persecution. And Paul writes to them, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, there is debate whether it's Paul or whether it is Barnabas, but whoever wrote it was inspired of God, and he told them to know that God was going to be present. God is going to walk with you. He is taking hold of your heart. Don't allow the devil to take away your joy out of anxiety. I don't know what joys, what sickness, what heartache, what trouble, and what awaits you in the new year, but I know. I am assured that the almighty God himself has said that he will never leave you and he will not forsake you. And therefore, you can boldly say that the Lord is my help. I am going to be protected. I will not fear what man can devise against me. Brothers and sisters, that's the message that God has given me for you. That this year, he is going to make provisions for you. That this year, he is going to protect you. That this year, God is going to be present. His presence is going to be with you. That this year, his promise will stand. Amen? So we can face 2020 devoid of any anxiety. Amen? I will close by reading these words from a hymn. It says, O a soul, are you here without comfort and rest? Marching down the rough pathway of time, Make Jesus your friend ere the shadows grow dark or before the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept of his peace so sublime. Oh, a soul, are you here without comfort and rest? Marching down the rough pathway of time make Jesus your friend ere the shadows grow dark oh accept of his peace so sublime peace peace wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my soul. I forget the other words. But it will sweep over our soul. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father. We pledge to the extent of our abilities to do away with covetousness, to do away with anxiety. But we need the help of your Holy Spirit. So that, Lord, we can be assured, as your word promises, of your provisions. Your promise is sure. And we receive it with thanksgiving. Like Mount Zion, it is forever established. It is immovable. It is as good as you are. Lord, 
you have said that you will not leave us. You will not abandon any one that looks to you. Lord, you have promised that you will not let go of your hand, let go of our hand. You will walk with us in the darkest valley. You will walk with us at the top of every mountain. You will carry us in the sunshine. You will carry us when it rains. You have said when we walk through storms, you will be there. When we walk through fires, we will not be alone. When there are fires, you will be present. When there are rejoicing, celebration, joys, you will be present. Lord, help us not to ignore your presence. Save us from selfishness. And cause us to remember that you are there. You will protect us. You will fight our battles. And we will be more than conquerors in the year that is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for 2020. It's a great year. It's a beautiful year. It's a blessed year. It's a year full of hope. It's a year full of victory. It's a year full of wonderful testimonies. It's a year when you are giving us mountains. You are giving us our inheritance. It's a year, dear Lord, when all will be well because of your promise. You have said it. We believe it. We take it. We live by it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great 2020. Happy New Year.